So returning to the great discourse on the four establishments of mindfulness. So when I was talking about the Vedana, to use Vedana as a practice, the best thing to do is get as concentrated as you can and then just open up your hearing. And for every sound you hear, notice whether you're judging it as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Okay, just whatever comes along, that's notice that you're doing that. And once you get a sense of how that's working, then you can try it with touch. Again, get concentrated. And then just while you're sitting there, examine your body for sense of touch. All right. There might be some discomfort in your knee and maybe a, some pleasure with the breeze blowing on your face or whatever. And you could just sort of do a body scan, uh, not so formally, but just looking through your body, trying to notice what bodily sensations can I notice? Most of them will probably be neither pleasant nor unpleasant. But some might be a little pleasant. Some might be a little unpleasant. Once you figure out, okay, this is how I work with Vedna with hearing and touch, then try it with food, right? You put a bite of food in your mouth. There's the taste and there's also the texture, both of which can produce Vedna. One is touch Vedna, one is taste Vedna. And notice the Vedna. It's tricky. I remember trying this with strawberries. And no, I was lost in the pleasure of the strawberries. It was just too good. And I couldn't pick up the Vedna until the third try. It was, I was just running off into, oh boy, this is really good. And it was only the third attempt that I could actually sense the Vedna. And then having worked with it with those three, yeah, if you smell something, you can notice pleasant, unpleasant, neutral with the smell. But that's sort of random, unless maybe you go to a perfume counter or something. The most difficult one is sight, because we run so quickly past the colored shapes to our interpretation of the colored shapes, and we're into the mental bit of it quite, uh, quite quickly. So the best way to work with visual Vedana is go to a modern art museum or something that you, you, can't, you can't identify what the colored shapes are. You can just see the colored shapes and whether they are pleasant or unpleasant. I didn't know anything about Vedna when I was a little kid, but remembering uh, something from my childhood uh, about visual Vedna uh, was, was helpful. See, the house that we moved into when I was four, in the kitchen, it had a tile floor, and it was made up of large dark blue squares and small dark orange squares. It was hideous. That was what was there. And we move in and my mom gets up in the morning and she has to light the pilot light on the stove. And she bends over to light the pilot light and almost throws up. She thinks she might be pregnant. All right. And the same thing the next morning. On the third morning, she was so nauseated she had to get my father to light the pilot light. He goes in, bends over to light the pilot light and almost throws up. He knows he's not pregnant. It was the floor. First thing in the morning, if you looked at the floor, the orange and blue tiles were at different heights and it was literally nauseating. It was <laughs> some of the most unpleasant visual Vedna I've ever experienced. And you quickly learned First thing in the morning, don't look at the floor. Just don't look at the floor. After some years, we did get a new floor put in. But yeah, the Vedna was literally nauseating. It was that unpleasant. And then for working with the aggregates, the idea is to know them, to know I'm experiencing form. I'm experiencing Vedna. I'm experiencing 
conceptualizing, I'm experiencing my thoughts, emotions, memories, intentions, and I'm experiencing consciousness. And then to also notice their arising and passing. So a good practice is once you're concentrated, then just open up your awareness and notice whatever arises and whatever passes in your awareness. This is not quite choiceless awareness because you're choosing to notice whatever arises and passes. There are going to be sounds arising and passing. There are going to be body sensations arising and passing possibly a smell that arises and passes, thoughts that arise and hopefully pass, and your breathing, a lot of arising and passing there. And you're not focusing in on anything. You're just on the lookout for arisings and passings. You become an arisings and passings locator. All right, the bell rings. Okay, rising and passings there. The passing of sitting and the arising of standing, the passing of standing, the arising of walking. And you're just paying attention to arising and passing. When you're doing your walking meditation, you're noticing arising and passing rather than the physical sensations of walking. When you're eating, you're noticing arising and passing. When you come back to meditate, you sit down and then forget about rising and passings, get concentrated again. And then back to arising and passing. This is a really powerful practice, but it's really slow moving. I like to give it to students on the month long course that I do most years because yeah, it might take two weeks before it really gets to cooking. But if you wanna play with it now, that's a possibility. So any questions about using Vedana or Khandas as uh, basis for insight practice. Okay, so continuing to look at the sutta, the next practice is the six internal and external sense bases. Again, one abides contemplating phenomena as phenomena with respect to the six internal and external sense bases. The word basis here is the same word when we talk about the, the base of infinite space or the realm of infinite consciousness. So it's the thing, the eyeball or the sight object, the ear or the sound or infinite space. And how does one do so? Here one knows the eye knows sight objects, and knows whatever fetter arises dependent on the two. And one knows how an unrisen fetter comes to arise, and one knows how the abandonment of a risen fetter comes about, and one knows how the non-arising of the abandoned fetter in the future will come about. One knows the ear and sounds, nose and smells, tongue and taste, body and tangibles, mind and mind objects, and knows the fetter, knows how it arises, how it can be abandoned, and how it can be prevented in the future. So like with the hindrances, these are the first two of the four great efforts. So an example, you're walking down the street, you're just going somewhere, and you glance into a shop window and oh, they have those on sale in just the right color. They're in stock. Yeah, right. I mean, you were just walking down the street, but now greed hasn't risen. You know, you've got enough on your credit card. You're going to go in and get one of those. This, this is a fetter arising due to sight object and eyeball. Or you the some advertisement for something that you know is horrible and aversion arises right again it's the side object and this this aversion has arisen you come to the bakery whose door is open and the smells are coming out and they grab hold of your nose and they drag you into the bakery the smell was pleasant 
and the fetter of greed has arisen and you're going to go eat a nice healthy cinnamon roll or whatever it is. Our sensory input can lead us into, yeah, all sorts of problems if we're not careful about it. So the idea is to be aware of your reaction to your sensory input and to figure out, okay, what sort of problematic mind state has arisen due to the sensory input? What can I do to get out of this problematic mind state? And how can I prevent it from happening in the future? Fairly easy to talk about, uh, kind of hard to remember to do. The six senses don't get talked about that much in standard Vipassana, Western Buddhism, but they were obviously really important to the Buddha. In the Samyutta Nikaya, there is a book of, you know, the senses, and it has 248 suttas. It's more than any other book in the Samyutta Nikaya. And I mentioned that the Buddha gave 10 talks where someone became fully awakened. The two topics that show up most often are the khandhas, that's what we had yesterday, and the six senses. And realizing that seeing can happen without there being a seer postulated. Normally, you know, when there's seeing going on, I'm the one that's seeing. But it is possible to just step back far enough and see that seeing is happening. You don't need to make up a seer. That's, that's an optional thing, this creation of the one who is doing it. Probably you remember when you were in school, they told you don't write in the passive voice. You know, have, have a subject and a verb and an object. But it turns out on the spiritual path, it's very useful to do something in the passive force. So instead of thinking I'm seeing, think of seeing is happening. So yeah, one does this internally and externally. So you're walking down the street with your friend and your friend sees one of those in the window and gets all greedy and whatnot. And you can see, yep, they got caught by their senses as well. They're rising and passing. I mean, when you come to the bakery and you exhale and you take in a deep breath to smell what's there, uh, how long does that last? You know, you're not going to get more than about, I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds out of it. Not, probably not even that much. Right? The, the sensory input is changing all the time. Notice that. This can be helpful for not getting caught. And thus, mindfulness is established just to the extent necessary for knowledge and awareness. And one abides independent, not clinging to anything in this world. Questions, comments? When the Vedana of the senses is more of a pleasant, unpleasant, neutral exploration, as opposed to the six senses where you're it's more of a rising and passing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The Vedana, of course, are arising and passing as well. But the real key is to see the Vedana and then to see how they lead you around, how we go running after the pleasant and running away from the unpleasant. And so it's our relationship to the pleasant and unpleasant that we're trying to see. Whereas with the senses, it's, yeah, how does sensory input get us into trouble? And some of it may be because of the Vedana. There's a sensory input, the smell of the bakery, that's a pleasant smell. And so it's the sensory input and it's pleasant that draws us into the bakery, but it's you could do both at that time. You can notice the sensory input and you can notice the Vedana of it. When you see one of those in the window for sale, 
it's probably not the colored shape of the thing that's really got you. It's probably kind of neutral sight Vedana, but then you identify what it is and you start thinking about it. So now it's the mental Vedana that's drawing you in. Or you see somebody walking down the street wearing the colors of the enemy team and you immediately dislike this person. Maybe the colors are actually kind of nice. You, you see it, the colors are nice, but you recognize, oh, this is someone that's a fan of the Dodgers or whatever. And you immediately start disliking this person, but that's all mental processing that's going on. So there was the sight Vedana, neutral, maybe even pleasant. No real reaction based on the Vedana, but then you take it in, you interpret what you're seeing and all the thoughts that are going on in your mind and it produces an unpleasant, oh, they're a fan of the Dodgers. And yeah, now you become upset and you dislike this person and everything based on the Vedana of your reaction to that sight. But the sight was the trigger for it. Okay, so understands the eye, understands the forms, understands the fetter that arises dependent on both. So is that just referring to sensual desire? Is that the fetter? Well, they're the 10 fetters, right? So the wrong view of self, the uh, belief in the efficacy of rites and rituals, doubt, those are go at the first level of awakening. Then there's greed and hatred that are weakened at the second and uprooted at the third. And then finally, desire for form, desire for formless, ignorance, restlessness, and conceit. So that's the fetters you find mentioned in the suttas. However, there's fetters mentioned in the Abhidhamma, which are different. And these are sensuality, resentment, pride, wrong views, doubt, desire for becoming, attachment to rites and rituals, jealousy, avarice, and ignorance. So there's some overlap between the two, but basically the fetter is something that got you into trouble, right? Something that's binding you to the wheel of samsara. And yeah, it's Generally, you can boil it all down to greed, hatred, and delusion at its, at its lowest level. But you can, you can say, appreciate the, the, the pastry or whatever without, without falling prey to the fetter, just, or, or what? Well, you, you might... You might appreciate the smell coming out of the bakery and just keep on walking. And therefore you didn't fall into the fetter. But if you turn into the bakery and go get the pastry, then yeah, knowing that what you're about to get is probably not the best health food available, then yeah, you've fallen, you've fallen into the fetter of greed for taste pleasant Vedana, and so you're eating the pastry. Now, it doesn't mean that you should not eat pleasant food or anything like that. When the pleasant comes along, then enjoy it. And when the unpleasant comes along, then deal with the situation. But try not to get hooked into stuff based on what you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, etc. So I find that further along we go in this course, the more questions I have, I don't know if that's Papancha or what, but um, <laughs> so it feels not scary to try to apply these practices to say a pastry, because if I fail, no biggie, right? I can try in the next couple of minutes and if I succeed. Great. Just keep practicing. But the thing I think that occurred to me um, is maybe the, the most difficult thing to practice on are the people in our lives that we care about. Because 
I have a sense for the people that I love that I'm like, there's a, there's a person there or there's a person in there, or there's a, there's like a real thing that uh, is not just a collection of whatever. Right. And that essence, it's like, you feel attached to that. And then it, it, it feels a little scary to think, okay, let me try to do this practice with these things that I care most deeply about. Right. On the relative level, there is a person there. There's you and there's the person you love from the relative perspective. And as I said, both perspectives are necessary. You can't just switch from one to the other. And, you know, like you run along in the relative and you switch to the absolute and then that's it. You just run from the absolute level. That doesn't work. You need to pick the appropriate perspective. And so when you're interacting with people, you're going to be interacting on the relative level. But your attachment to these people, if you really step back, uh, these people, although they're dear and delightful, they're subject to changing and vanishing, right? How are you going to feel about that? So it's also helpful to take the other perspective, not at the point that you're interacting with them. That's just probably going to screw up the interaction. But to realize, yeah, if my happiness depends on this person being around and this person is no longer around, then, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be miserable or whatever. And, yeah, that may be the case, but you need to realize that's part of what's going on. Right? So I'm not saying don't operate on the relative level. In fact, when I do the meta every night, that's a very much a relative level practice. Right? So you, you've got to operate on the relative level as well. But it's helpful to understand the, looking from the other perspective about everything, the pastries and the people you love. I was thinking about some threat and um, how quickly thoughts move. Any suggestions on watching a rising and passing of thought? Because usually I, I find myself way down the line, you know, in thought, however direction it's going. And that just seems very challenging. Like feeling, like I can feel stuff a little bit more physically. I can kinesthetically feel stuff. But seeing thought movement, mind movement, slow it down enough and especially out there in the wild not in retreat land but yeah working with a rising and passing you want to get really concentrated first so that when a thought comes up you see it and can let it go as opposed to get lost in it remember concentrated really means indistractable so a thought comes up because, yeah, you're not focused in and locking everything out. But can you see it come up and just let it go? The thought comes into the station and you don't get on the thought train and ride it away. Out there in the world, yeah, it's a lot more difficult. It's, I mean, working with thoughts like that and seeing their arising and passing is definitely much easier, although still difficult, post jhana post generating good concentration than it is out there in the world where we get lost in our thoughts all the time. Ideally, we wouldn't get lost in our thoughts all the time, but realistically, yeah, we're probably going to still get lost in our thoughts until we're fully awakened. And so, yeah, notice when you've gotten lost in your thoughts and at least be not lost. Sometimes, you can just drop the thoughts because they were useless. And sometimes, yeah, it's something that you actually do need to pursue and keep thinking about, but at least think about it with some awareness that that's what you're doing. Does this help? I think so. Cause I do like in concentration, like on this retreat, you can totally like, Oh, there's a thought and yeah. like wispy, like in the, in the lower states of uh, concentration of jhana that you can see that it seems to me more like even just doing a walking meditation and um just notice like oh it's like you it's like you take the leash off yeah <laughs> like the dog's yeah. being really good and you take the leash off and off you run. <laughs> yeah 
Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we're trying to train the dog to come back, right? <laughs> right. And the the third foundation, the knowing your state of mind is really important when you're off leash. Because if your mind state gets to be problematic, you need to deal with that instead of just letting it run crazy and scare the squirrels up the tree. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anything else on the six senses? Okay. Moving along. The next is the seven factors of awakening. Again, one abides contemplating phenomena as phenomena with respect to the seven factors of awakening. And how does one do so? Here, if the awakening factor of mindfulness is present in oneself, one knows that it is present. If the awakening factor of mindfulness is absent in oneself, one knows that it is absent. And one knows how the unarisen awakening factor of mindfulness comes to arise. And one knows how the complete development of the awakening factor of mindfulness comes about. If the awakening factor of investigation of phenomena, of energy, of piti, of tranquility, of concentration, of equanimity is present, one knows it's present. If it's absent, one knows it's absent. And one knows how an awakening factor comes to arise, and one knows how the complete development of an awakening factor comes about. So this is the seven factors of awakening. These are the mind states you want to cultivate. And this is the fifth of the original practices. So the original practices were parts of the body, Vedana, mind states, hindrances, and factors of awakening. And it's the opposite of the hindrances, basically. The hindrances are states that you want to make go away and keep away. So the first two of the four great efforts. And these are the states you want to make arise and keep around and bring to perfection. And so the second two of the four great efforts. These could be divided into three different groups. The first group would be mindfulness all by itself. And then would be the energizing factors. And that's investigation of phenomena, energy, and PT. And then the tranquility factors, calming factors, would be tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And it's really important to keep them in balance. If you get too much of the calming factors, yeah, it can make you kind of spacey. And if you get too much of the energizing factors, uh, that can lead to restlessness. But you can never have too much mindfulness. So you could think of a seesaw and you put the mindfulness there at the pivot and then you stack the other three up and you want to keep it in balance. There was one point where I was teaching a retreat at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. And when I got there, there was a note on the board for me from a student, former student who was up at the Forest Refuge who wanted an interview. And at that time, it was possible to do something like that. And so I left a note and the person showed up for their interview. And we started talking and they were just doing jhana practice, like all day long, no insight practice, just jhanas, jhanas, jhanas. And I'm like, wait a second, you can't do that. The whole purpose of the jhanas is to warm you up for your insight practice. You need to get these in balance. The person goes, oh, maybe, maybe that's why I'm having trouble doing my yogi job. The staff is kind of worried about me because I'm getting so spacey. It's like, yeah. <laughs> You need to balance out the concentration with investigation. Basically, you need to balance out the calming factors with the energizing factors. 
And so the person went back to the forest refuge and I saw them again. They were there for like, I don't know, 10 months or something. I saw them again right at the end of their time there. And they said, oh, thank you very much. When I went back, I started doing insight practice and yeah, all the spaciness went away and I was able to do my job and the staff was no longer worried about me. So yeah, you don't just do jhanas. I mean, if you're sharpening a knife and you just keep sharpening and sharpening and sharpening, uh, yeah, knife is gone and you didn't cut through anything. So get your mind sharp and then investigate phenomena. Do your insight practice. So these are the states we want to cultivate. And they're basically the opposites, the antidotes to the hindrances. Oh, one other thing I could say, they do seem to build on each other. If you're mindful, it makes it much easier to do your investigation of phenomena. When you do your investigation of phenomena and you start getting some insights, that gives you energy. You can convert that energy into PT. You can calm down the PT to tranquility and get really concentrated, especially when you arrive at the fourth jhana and are very equanimous. There you have mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. You've got really good mindfulness now, which is really going to help your investigation. So you can think of it as a spiral. Just each one is helping the other one become more beneficial as you go. So questions. So I just wanted to clarify for, for my notes, because you've, you, you spoke to five original practices, uh -huh. um, including body scan, Vedanas, hindrances, and then is the fourth one mind states? Yes. So is that the, the third foundation of mindfulness? Yeah. So it's actually... It's not body scan, it's parts of the body. Of the and body. then body scan is a later development, probably in Burma in the 18th or 19th century. So parts of the body, Vedana, mind states, hindrances, seven factors. So what is the um, source of this observation that these are the original practices? Is it, is it from a collection of suttas or? When we take a look at, the two versions in the Pali Canon in the suttas and the one version in the Abhidhamma and the two version in the Chinese Agamas and the Sanskrit version and the Tibetan version, what we find is those five show up, I think everywhere except one place have, have all five and one of them is missing in one, one of the places. If you want to know more about this. There's a PDF file on my reading list called A History of Mindfulness by Bhikkhu Sujato. And it's quite good. Uh, and he goes through and says, okay, these are the versions that we found and these are the practices in them. And it looks like these five were the original ones. And the version that we have in the Pali Canon, he thinks actually arrived in the state we have it, probably in Sri Lanka, that where all the practices were put in. So what went to Sri Lanka didn't contain all these practices in this particular order. We don't know exactly what did go. What we find in Chinese is a couple of different versions. Some of them have the same, some of the practices are the same as we find in the Pali. Some are different and some of the Pali ones are left out. So the jhanas show up under body in one of the Chinese versions, but the jhanas don't show up in the other Chinese version or the Pali version. So anyhow, it's, it's a very well-written article. And if you're interested in Sutta archaeology, he talks a good bit in there about how you would go about determining what is early material versus late material. And so it's, it's an interesting article for a number of reasons. Could you speak a little more to the investigation of phenomena? Yeah, this is basically your insight practice. So all the insight practices we've talked about, 
five daily recollections, body scan, Vedna, rising and passing, whatever you think of when you think of standard Vipassana, all the Tibetan practices, all the Zen practices. Yeah, all of these would be investigation of phenomena, lots of different ways. Four elements, charnel ground contemplations, paying attention to your postures, mindfulness of everything you do. All of these would be investigation of phenomena. Just, uh, I might have missed when you were reading the seven factors. Um, you, 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 the way how I understood it, you mentioned that it's balancing the calming concentration with the energizing, uh, which comes from inside and um, mindfulness kind of observing, reg not regulating somebody. So why is it seven five? Because I can see three. Okay. So why is first, it called? First, first is mindfulness. And then there's investigation. Then there's energy. Then there's PT. Then there's tranquility. Concentration. And equanimity. The a sutta that mentions them is the Discourse on Mindfulness of Breathing. And they're talked about at the end of that discourse. And that's Majima 118. Plus, in the Connected Discourses, there's a whole book on the seven factors of awakening with, I don't know, 50, 100 suttas, something like that. What is the difference between tranquility and equanimity? I know equanimity has a balancing factor, but they're both so quiet. How can you recognize when tranquility is present versus equanimity? So the tranquility, everything is peaceful. The word equanimity means standing near, literally. So you get peaceful and now you can take a look at anything and not get upset. So it's a balance of mind. So the, the tranquility is just getting you calm enough that you might have a chance now to look at something that might be a little disturbing and not be disturbed or look at something that might be attractive and not be attracted, right? So you can stand near it and it won't knock you off balance. So the tranquility is sort of like getting you geared up for this. And then the equanimity is actually going out there into the world and still keeping your tranquility, no matter what's coming at you. Does that help? Anything else? Okay. Of course, internally, externally, rising and passing, etc. The fifth of the factors in the fourth establishment is the Four Noble Truths. Again, one abides contemplating phenomena as phenomena with respect to the Four Noble Truths. And how does one do so? Here, one knows as it really is, this is dukkha. One knows as it really is, this is the origin of dukkha. One knows as it really is, this is the cessation of dukkha. One knows as it really is, this is a way of practice leading to the cessation of dukkha. To do this as a practice, anytime you experience dukkha, you need to say, this is dukkha, you know, call it out. Now, if the Buddha is correct, the dukkha arose dependent on craving. Can you find the craving? That's a little more challenging than just saying this is dukkha, but usually you can find the craving. You somehow in some way want the world to be different than it is. Now, that's the origin of the dukkha. Now, can you let go of the craving? That maybe is not possible. It may be that, yeah, you see it's dukkha, you see the craving, and yeah, you're not going to be able to let go of that craving. Okay, you're stuck. 
it's still going to be dukkha. But if you do manage to let go of the craving, does the dukkha go away? This is what you're investigating. Is the Buddha tell the truth? You experience some dukkha, you find the craving associated with it, you let that craving go. Yeah, this should take care of the dukkha. And then, of course, this is the way of practice leading to the cessation of dukkha, means that you know and understand the Eightfold Path and you're practicing it. So taking a look at your views, being aware of your intentions, using right speech, keeping the precepts, making a living in a way that makes the world a better place rather than a worse place, guarding your mind so that you can do the four great efforts, being mindful and learning to concentrate your mind. Questions on the Four Noble Truths as a mindfulness practice. What follows next in the sutta, the long one, and does not appear in the middle length one, is the detailed explanation of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, which was the basis for my talk on the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path that I gave way back at the beginning of the course. And of course, internal, external, rising and ceasing, etc. Questions? What is the four great efforts? To make an arisen unwholesome state go away. To prevent an unwholesome state from arising. To make an unarisen wholesome state arise. And to make an arisen wholesome state stick around and come to perfection. Okay, so this is the only sutta that comes with a guarantee. Whoever should practice these four establishments of mindfulness for just seven years may expect one of two results. Either arahantship in this life or if there be some substrate left, the state of a non-returner. Okay, all you got to do is be mindful without a break for seven years. And you either get fully awakened or at least the third stage. This is pretty good. Let alone seven years, whoever should practice them for just six years, five years, four years, three years, two years, one year, may expect one of two results. Let alone one year, whoever should practice these for just seven months. Six months, five months, four months, three months, two months, one month, half a month may expect one of two results. Let alone half a month. Whoever should practice these four establishments of mindfulness for just one week may expect one of two results. Either arahantship in this life or if there be some substrate left, the state of a non-returner. So all you got to do is be 100% mindful for a week. Yeah, and you at least get the third stage. I guess I should have told you this at the beginning of the course, but hey, you can do it on your next retreat. Right? Just, just be mindful all the time. It was said, there is this one going path that leads to the purification of beings for the overcoming of sorrow and distress, for the disappearance of pain and sadness, for the gaining of the right path, for the realization of Nibbana, that is to say, the four establishments of mindfulness. And it is for this reason that it was said. Thus the Blessed One spoke, and the monks rejoiced and were delighted in his words. Questions, comments? That was a bit of a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> At Cloud Mountain, they have a bunch of teacups and you, you, you pick your teacup, right? And there's one of them that's a Gary Larson cartoon. And it's the little kid standing up saying, Mr. Osborne, may I be excused? My brain is full. And people have pointed out, yep, that's what I'm doing to him on my retreats. Sorry. Take what you find useful. Let the rest of it go. If you sit with me again, you'll probably hear the same stuff over again. You can maybe get some more of it. 
but wanted to put out there sort of the basis of what this is what the Buddha is teaching, right? It, he's saying the gradual training is really important. You know, keep the precepts, guard your senses, be mindful, be content with little, get rid of the hindrances, concentrate your mind, investigate reality. And he's saying the way to investigate reality is, yeah, the four establishments of mindfulness. Here's a bunch of practices you can do. So it's not simple, but I do find it useful and hope at least some of what I've said is useful. 